<laughs> to repeat, most of the sessions at the symposium deal with recorded music, but gramophones and phonographs are also talking machines, and each of the presentations in this session will deal with recorded speech, which we believe is similarly worthy of studying its local contexts at home on 78 RPM records and other contemporaneous formats, assuming that each market around the world will have experienced its own unique interplay between technical industrial factors, emergent practices and ideologies associated with recorded sound, and local hierarchies of value associated with specific speech genres and ways of speaking. Without more ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Will Prentice, who is, among other things, an audio preservation specialist at the Phonogrammarchie, part of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna, a trustee of the EMI Archive Trust, and a 23-year veteran of the British Library Sound Archive. And as a man of impeccable taste himself, I consider no one more qualified to speak about taste. Will. Well, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here. It's really uh, lovely to finally be in Zagreb, where I've wanted to visit for many years. Um, all three papers we're about to deliver are interconnected in certain ways that will reveal themselves. So we've decided that we'll uh, keep comments and questions for the end uh, after the three papers, but please do make a note. Um, at one point, I will ask you some questions and um, you can make notes. Great. And I will see them at the end. So as Patrick um, mentioned there, um, the early perceptions of sound recording technology often focused on its role as a talking machine. Ambitions of Edison and other business entrepreneurs focused on speech, whereas history followed the money in another direction, the musical one. So what happened? And how do commercial spoken word recordings relate to the output of the industry as a whole? How might the role of commercial spoken word recordings differ across different global markets? <clears throat> and separate to these questions, I have an interest in the so-called Orient catalogue produced by the gramophone company beginning in 1899, which in its first 15 years alone, up to the First World War, already contained almost 28,000 recordings made in more than 100 locations. There's a rather chilling quote attributed to Stalin. He said, or is purported to have said, one death is a tragedy, 10,000 deaths is a statistic. So we could say 178 RPM recording is a thing of wonder, but 28,000 recordings mm -hmm. is a massive black wall of stuff. How do we comprehend that massive black wall of stuff? The stuff it contains is so rich, it's like a forest of information with a million possible paths through it and no simple way to understand it as a whole. But I want to tell you about a forest's worth of 78 RPM discs. I'm gonna to attempt to cut a path through it, only one path of many possible paths. So as I've mentioned, the forest that I'm interested in is the gramophone company's so-called Orient catalogue, or at least the first 15 years of that catalogue. And the path I'm going to cut through it is via the spoken word material that that catalogue contains. I'm interested in what this catalogue might tell us about the world at that time, about culture and about taste. To understand the catalogue as a view of the world, we need to understand something of the lens that we're looking through. And one way of understanding that is to consider the company's selection criteria for artists and for repertoire. In Western Europe, the company used their own taste to do that. It was quite easy for the people in the company to, to work out what was a high quality opera singer or pianist or violin player. But what about in parts of the world where their own tastes were of no commercial use? How did they do that? So um, I'm gonna focus on the first 15 years, as I said, of the company's Orient catalog. What, what was the Orient catalog? Um, the term is problematic today, but it was actually problematic 120 years ago too. Um, it began 
with the recording in London of uh, some artists of Indian and Persian Iranian origin, and also some uh, recordings of what were deemed Hebrew material by Jewish uh, uh, performers and speakers in London. Uh, but it really was material from any language outside of Western European most common languages. The company divided separate catalogues according to language. They had a, uh, a German catalogue, an Italian catalogue, a French catalogue, an English catalogue, and for the other stuff, they had a, an Orient catalogue. So it's problematic, and even in a basic geographical sense, the majority of the recordings probably came from Europe. Um, but a large number were from uh, other geographical uh, regions. And I'm going to use uh, use modern contemporary country names and modern contemporary country borders just for consistency. And I'm going to use global regions as defined by UNESCO. So these recordings were made in um, uh, what we think of as Europe, what we think of as Asia, and what we think of as the Arab states. Um, so in terms of some caveats, this data is based on um, electronic discographical data produced by Dr. Alan Kelly, the late Dr. Kelly. Many of you may know this, there's a, a link to a database containing his data here. Uh, Dr. Kelly spent um, the majority of his life just uh, visiting EMI, um, producing the most incredible discographical information of the company's in output across the world. <clears throat> In the latter years of his life, he published it electronically, in, in actually in Word documents. But it's been turned into uh, uh, an electronic database, which is online, uh, accessible for free. Uh, so it's an incredible resource, but it's not 100% complete, particularly for the Oriental catalog. Uh, additionally, uh, within the catalog, there was a systematic taxonomy of instrumental or vocal performance type. So spoken word content had its own category, which I've used here. So if you look at a basic, many of you will know this, some of you will not. If you look at a basic catalog uh, number, or the, the core part of a catalog number for a 10 inch disc on the gramophone company, it will have five digits. Hang on, five. <coughs> oh, or if you're looking from the other side, five. <coughs> the first digit denotes the language. Uh, in our case, the Orient catalog is number is digit one. The second digit denotes the uh, the musical taxonomy, so or the taxonomy in general. So this, the second digit, if the second digit is a one, it's spoken word. If it's a two, it's a solo male voice. If it's a three, it's a solo female voice. If it's a four, it's a choir, and so on. Then you have violin, piano. You there's you know bagpipe category. Uh, but because of this taxonomy, it's very easy for me to go through tens of thousands of lines of Alan Kelly's data to find everything that begins with a one and say, okay, that's Oriental. Everything that begins with one one is Oriental spoken word. So that's how I was able to produce my own table of 28,000 lines from his hundreds of thousands of lines. But again, it's not 100% accurate. The company sometimes uh, denoted something as spoken word when it was something other than that. Uh, the numbers reflect the items that were catalogued for release, not the items recorded. The company recorded some material which was never designated for release. Perhaps the wax master was broken in transit or it was deemed not worthy of release at some stage. But nonetheless, everything that was released appears, but uh, was given a catalog number. Um, some artists were recorded in locations other than their home locations. So when you will see long lists here of, uh, of, of geographic locations, they don't necessarily reflect the cultures that were recorded. Many Kazan Tatar recordings were made in Moscow, for example. Many Polish recordings were made in Berlin. Uh, no recordings were made in present day Armenia, but there are hundreds of Armenian recordings made in Tbilisi and elsewhere, for example. Uh, the content information, the titles and sometimes the artists are not stated in the uh, Kelly data often, um, particularly for the Orient material. So we're, we're somewhat listed, uh, uh, limited in what we have there. 
Uh, we only know about the number of titles recordings, not the sales figures, unfortunately. So that's we're slightly limited there too. But I assume that when items continue or genres continue to be recorded over time, that denotes some level of popularity. They weren't doing it for no reason. So here's my basic data set. 27,958 recorded sides in the Orient catalog recorded in 101 locations. Uh, Dalmatia isn't one, sadly, if there was 101, that would be funny. Um, in 43 countries, as I mentioned, that those countries in the modern, uh, using a modern mm -hmm. to denote those. Of those, 1,097 are spoken word sites recording 45 locations in 32 countries. Therefore, just under 4% of the catalog is spoken word material, one in 25. So that's an interesting a uh, bit of information in itself. But how does that break down geographically? Let's start initially with the uh, regions, the global regions. So <clears throat> you can see from this table, the highest number of recordings was in Europe, 13,504. But actually the highest percentage uh, of book and word materials was in Asia. So uh, Asia had 10,549 total recordings of which 627 were spoken word. So the percentage of spoken word material relative to the total number is the main thing here uh, to me uh, in, in terms of its uh, significance within that region. But it's slightly easier to look at the information in graph form. So let's look at this table uh, in the form of a graph. I'll take a moment to explain it because this is uh, how I'm gonna present most of the other data. The three geographical regions are represented as three pairs of uh, bars, you can see here. The larger, lighter one is the token number of recordings, the smaller, darker one is the spoken word material, and the scale for those is on the left, the number of recordings. <clears throat> the percentage that the spoken word represents is shown by the line, the thin line, and the scale for that is on the right hand side. So you can see here that although European recordings uh, were the largest group within spoken word material, uh, sorry, within the uh, uh, the catalog, the highest percentage of spoken word was in Asia. You can see that from the line. So let's break that down even further. And let's start with the, uh, the, the Arab states. And you can see here the countries. It would be nice to spend more time just staring at these and talking about the different locations in which recordings were made. I mean, it's such a significant catalog as a, as a as a potential resource for, for research to me, it's just a, it's mind boggling. So there were, in, in modern day terms, there were five countries recordings were made here. Um, so the most recordings were in Egypt and Algeria, but the highest spoken word percentage was in Tunisia, 3.69. But that's still lower than the overall average of 3.92 I mentioned earlier. Uh, there were zero rec spoken word recordings made in Morocco, interestingly. Looking at Asia, by far the most uh, spoken word recordings were made in India. Uh, and that's even before the First World War, there were 5,176 recordings. And that's modern day India, that's excluding Pakistan and so on. <clears throat> but only 2.76 uh, of those were spoken word recording. Interestingly for me, uh, the second most recordings by country was, was in Uzbekistan. I mean, would you have guessed that? before the First World War, 12,000, uh, sorry, 1,214 recordings made in Tashkent, Bukhara, Samarkand, and the Fergana Valley. But actually, looking at the graph on the left-hand side, um, the country with by, high, by far the highest spoken word percentage was Myanmar. 40% of the recordings made there were are defined as spoken word by the country, by the, the company. So that's kind of interesting. Let's come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> but if we take a look at Europe, um, and going by UNESCO definitions of where countries fit, um, Turkey fits within Europe, uh, 2,363 recordings made there before the First World War. Uh, Romania, in terms of items within the Orient catalogue, is uh, 1,616. Hungary, just over 1,000. But look, the highest spoken word percentage was in Croatia. 10.99, 11% uh, uh, were, were spoken word 
uh, recordings in Croatia. So we shall revisit that, of course. The top three locations for spoken word material uh, within the catalog are Myanmar, as I mentioned, uh, all made within Yangon, formerly Rangoon, uh, 319 spoken word recordings. Uh, in Japan, all made in Tokyo, uh, just under 20% of the recordings were spoken word, 54 size. In Croatia, all Zagreb, 61 spoken sides of 551. So how do we account for that? Why are there such a high percentage in these locations? What does it say about those locations? Or about, ooh, I'm jumping ahead. So um, frustratingly, there's, there's very little information about the content of these sides in the Alan Kelly data. But we know from the Myanmar recordings, um, they were recordings of what the ground from company referred to as Zat recordings or, or Piazat recordings, I think more commonly known. Uh, it's a, a tradition of orally transmitted dramas, uh, very, very long, uh, often lasting several hours. Uh, within the gramophone recordings, uh, these are described it's a Zat and it says a complete Zat in 40 recordings. Now, when uh, this happened in multiple recording sessions over multiple years, but each time, they were defined as 40 recordings, never 38 or 41, which suggests that the company decided that a, a, a performance that might take six hours, well, a reasonable maximum number of sides might be 40. So uh, that suggests a degree of compression of the original content into a fixed number. But the fact that they did this, uh, they recorded several Zats one year, he would return two years later and record several more Zats and would record, return later and record several more Zats, suggesting that they were selling. They were making, uh, <clears throat> they were making some kind of money out of this stuff. Um, I suspect that the material is not purely spoken word. I know that the Piazat uh, performances, in my very limited understanding, uh, consists of, of musical performance as well. So uh, it may be that the, the description of these as spoken word is somewhat simplistic. Nonetheless, um, it's kind of interesting that this material is, or this, this uh, cultural practice was reflected in the catalog in this very crude statistical way. In Japan, in Tokyo, and the company only visited Japan once in February 1903, because uh, in 1907, uh, the gramophone company and the Victor company made an agreement to, to slice the world up into two parts. Um, the, the rights to sell in Japan passed to Victor. So the gramophone company's interest in that territory ceased. But uh, again, there's very little information uh, in the company records about what was recorded there that, that is accessible to me. However, Fred Geisberg, who made the recordings, made some diary entries there, some of which have been published. And in those he mentions on several occasions visiting the theater in Tokyo, uh, where performances lasted in his account from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., continuous performances. There were intermissions between acts. During those intermissions, there were often separate one act plays taking place. Um, uh, and it was common um, for them to, to sort of take breaks and go out and, and, and for food to be delivered in and so on. So it's very likely that some of these theatrical performers were recorded uh, within these spoken word records. But what about Zagreb? Um, 61 spoken word sites. Most are all um, are dramatic or comedic de declarations. Some of them are dialogues, mostly monologues. By far the most popular performer was Arnost Grunt, who performs on 35 of these 61 sites. 24 of those are solo, uh, the remainders are, uh, are dialogues. So um, I think many people in this room will know much more about Arnold Grun than I do. Uh, he's born in 1866 in Prague, became a prominent theatrical performer in Zagreb um, and was a pioneering film performer. Translated into English, some, some typical titles uh, are scenes in the school, a peasant in a pharmacy, unhappy in marriage, ode to my flask, Electro electoral assembly, and my favorite, the grumpy husband returns home. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't only comedy and drama. In 1911, the gramophone company recorded a couple of sides by Yurai Devich in Zagreb, one apparently in Serb, the other in Croat, but both described as pikantna snimka. 
Spicy snapshots. <laughs> the business traveler and the hotel maid. And I dreamed I was a flea. So it seems that the gramophone company weren't entirely intended on recording family listening material. They were broadening their, uh, their market there. But a question for many of you, I'd like to hear your takes on this uh, when, when we get to the, the comments and questions at the end. Why the particular popularity of spoken word material in Zagreb uh, for, the, for the Croatian Zagreb market? Uh, is it a, a relative greater importance of theater? I mean, we're right across from the national theater here. Was it about humor? I thought that the, the questions this morning with the Professor Tan about uh, the role of humor and how humor makes us feel known was, was really fascinating. Um, I often think that if you want to take a motorway into the soul of a community, then try and work out what they find funny. That's a really, really interesting way of doing it. So um, uh, please uh, share what you, what you think about that. I don't, I'd assumed that an early emphasis on potential of the talking machine um, had very quickly been overtaken by art and entertainment, but was that an accurate assumption? So, yeah, getting short on time. Uh, looking at individual countries um, about how the, 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 the perception or the percentages of uh, spoken word material changed over time doesn't give a very clear position. If I look, if you look at this graph showing uh, how the percentages changed, did it go up, did it go down? Well, looking at it divided by Asia, Europe, and, and Arab, it's a very, very chaotic picture. It's not very useful. If we look at it by change over time combined, it gives, it looks like possibly there's a slight decrease over time, but actually, again, it's pretty, it's not clear at all. There's a slight suggestion of that. So is there anything in the internal gramophone company documentation to indicate how they thought about these issues? Well, I find a couple of clues as relates to language at least. In January, 1909, the assistant manager of the Russian branch, Louis Lebel, sent a request to the company's head office in London uh, for funds, for budget, to make 2,000 recordings that year in the Russian territory, of which 1,000 were to be made in the Caucasus and Central Asia. The head office refused his request, saying that Russian catalogue was already too big. Lebel pushed back, however, <laughs> stating confidently that there were exactly 108 languages in the Russian Empire. Uh, the company had, he said, recordings in 22 of those languages, but they should aim to have at least 40 of them in their catalogue. Head office were reluctantly persuaded to allow him to, persuade, to proceed. And uh, later in that year, uh, recording expert Franz Pampe uh, went to the Caucasus in Central Asia and recorded almost 1,200 sites in the Caucasus Central Asia, 200 more than the number that had been reluctantly agreed by head office. Head office were predictably furious, but that was the typical state of the relationship between the Russian branch and the London branch at that time anyway. Later that year, uh, Englishman Fred Tyler, who you can see in the middle of this picture, uh, took over as the manager of the Caucasian branch and wrote of the huge ethnographic diversity in the Caucasus and Central Asia, including territory of modern day Uzbekistan, and of his desire to quote, build up a satisfactory repertoire of representative records, which could satisfy such a wide market, unquote. Later he wrote that in his ex estimation, quote, records were made of nearly all dialects and representative instruments, unquote. So the company's taxonomy of instruments and ensemble types that I mentioned at the beginning wasn't just a way of describing the world, it was a way of seeing the world. It was a way that they used to organize what, how they saw, how they perceived the world. So in conclusion, um, three points. The spoken word content was clearly considered potentially profitable and was actively tested in the most markets as part of a systematic approach to exploring local tastes. Judging by what was recorded, it proved in a few markets at least to be of significant commercial interest. Second, there's no clear decline in the number of spoken word recordings over time, suggesting that they did actually meet a market desire, and so were reflective of local tastes to some degree. The sales figures would obviously help here, were they available. 
And finally, the variations across time and especially location are significant enough to further demonstrate that the company reacted to local tastes as any savvy commercial enterprise would do. Hopefully then this very general overview of the Oriental catalog and its spoken word content does reinforce the potential value of gramophone industry output as a reflection of contemporary culture and suggests some more specific areas worthy of further study. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Patrick. Beaster is a researcher and scholar of many years standing. He has a PhD in folklore and ethnomusicology. He's a published author, a three-time Grammy nominee. Um, and he brings a great deal of professional experience in archival preservation of audio collections. Patrick's also um, equally relevantly uh, a, a very good storyteller. So I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thank you, Will. I've long been interested in early commercial sound recordings that involve spoken language, partly because I find they can provide such unique insights into how people first came to terms with the possibility of recording events in one time and place for playback in other times and places, and how they went about creatively adapting performances of all kinds to fit these strange new circumstances. However, I based my past conclusions along these lines almost entirely on English language recordings made in the United States. The question I'd like to raise here then is whether the, the kinds of phenomenon I've been interested in played out differently within and across different cultures and linguistic communities and whether in the aggregate these cases might lead to new and different conclusions about the cultural evolution of recorded sound in general than the ones I've drawn based mostly on American examples. To be sure, other languages have traditions of commercial recording that are nearly as old as that of English in the United States. Among other things, discs for Emil Berliner's gramophone were first marketed not in America, but in Europe starting in 1890, and many of them contain spoken selections such as poetry, underscoring the multilingual character of Berliner's program. The paper labels affixed to these discs were color-coded by language even though, unfortunately, no examples have been found for many of the series listed here. As a record collector and media preservationist located in the American Midwest, my own exposure to early spoken word recordings in languages other than English has come largely from 78 RPM records marketed to and purchased by non-Anglophone immigrant communities in the United States. These turn up frequently there at antique stores and record shows, and I've made a point to buy discs of this kind whenever I see them. In my experience, the majority are on the Columbia label and belong overwhelmingly to two distinctive series, the E series and the F series. Columbia introduced its E series in 1908, shortly after converting most of its catalog from single faced to double faced pressings as a counterpart to the A series it used for its standard mainstream releases. From the start, the E series combined imported matrices recorded by Columbia's agents in Europe, primarily for release in Europe, with matrices recorded by members of non Anglophone immigrant communities in New York. Some of these matrices dated back as early as the year 1903, and many had already appeared on the American market as single-faced pressings. Later, in 1923, Columbia switched to a different organizational scheme, including an F series for foreign recordings that continued in use through the early 1950s. The E and F series together contained a vast amount of material, as Pekka Gronau observes their contents outnumbered Columbia's domestic releases uh, during the same period, even if each selection probably didn't sell as many copies as a typical domestic issue. Uh, Dick Spotswood uh, recently compiled a discography of the Columbia E-Series, which is available for free online through Mainspring Press. It has some gaps, but it's still a very useful reference. The majority of recordings in the Columbia E and F series were musical, including many instrumental recordings that contain no sung or spoken language of any kind. However, 
The Columbia Record, a trade journal distributed to Columbia dealers, presented differences of language as the central organizing principle for its international recording department. In announcing a new comprehensive catalog of foreign records in 1909, the Columbia Record characterized its contents first and foremost as, quote, records in foreign languages, asserting in all capitals that to foreign-born audiences, records in their own language have an irresistible attraction. Again, a few years later, the contents were described as covering records, quote, in 29 languages and dialects. True, the same piece also characterized the contents of these records as, quote, foreign music. But there's no discussion here about distinctive musical styles or genres. And even Spotswood's E-series discography, which is structured as a spreadsheet, uses the heading language slash dialect for its column of cultural designations. Now, records in foreign languages could conceivably refer to nothing more than the languages printed on their labels. And indeed, in the case shown here, an A-series xylophone solo of American Patrol has been converted into the E-series Hungarian selection, Amerikai Patrol, uh, simply by translating the label information into Hungarian. And so, the significance of a language designation usually ran deeper than this, with language serving even in the case of instrumental music as at least a synecdoche for community and culture. Taken as a whole, the Columbia e and series provide a convenient microcosm of 78 RPM records made for different linguistic communities in Europe and America over a number of years. So when I began trying to investigate cross-cultural differences in recorded speech, these series seemed like as good a place to start as any. Uh, that said, the boundaries of different communities we might want to compare and contrast with each other aren't necessarily straightforward. The category of Italian recordings provides a good example. The earlier parts of the E series contained a number of imported matrices of spoken word recordings uh, made in Milan during the early 19-teens, and these were identified on labels simply as Italian talking. However, a majority of Italian immigrants to the United States came from regions further south, such as Calabria and Sicily which were associated both with more divergent regional versions of standard Italian and with separate local Romance languages distinct from Italian with an ill-defined continuum in between. Thus, we also find records designated either as Neapolitan or as Italian with a reference to Neapolitan attached underneath the title. Others are designated as Sicilian, uh, even though they too were combined with the others into a single catalog, sometimes identified as Italian hyphen Neapolitan. Some matrices in each category had been recorded in Europe, while others had been recorded in America. So should we try to assess Italian recordings altogether as a group, or should we consider separating the European matrices from the American ones, or the Neapolitan records from the Sicilian ones? Well, I, I'd say the answer to all these questions is yes, uh, any of these groupings could be significant. But what I'll be presenting here is exploratory enough that I think we can, for the moment, set such subtleties aside. Soon after the nickel in the slot phonograph was introduced in the United States, starting in 1889, many of the most popular selections on them proved to be spoken word comedy routines, especially ones that centered on the conventionalized imitation of ethnically or racially distinctive ways of speaking, Irish, Black, German, Hebrew, and so forth. And some of these combined spoken dialogue with music and clever sound effects into more elaborate works of phonographic audio theater. During the early 1890s, such phonographic fictions seem to have been openly embraced for what they were. But after the turn of the century, the American commercial recording industry preferred to characterize works of audio theater as faithful recordings of performances of fiction on the stage, whether they actually were or not, consistent with a new emphasis on the authenticity and transparency of recordings more generally. Uh, this may help explain why media historians have paid so little attention to phonographic audio theater as an art form in its own right, even though it emerged simultaneously with the silent narrative film as a parallel creative endeavor and, in my opinion, deserves similar attention. Dick Spotswood's E-series discography lists numerous selections that appear based on their descriptions to be specimens of audio theater or other spoken word genres. 
Moreover, some recordings that seem from their labels or descriptions to be straightforwardly musical turn out upon listening to be pieces of audio theater in disguise, as it were. Um, here's an excerpt from this alleged uh, comic song. <laughs> <laughs> Recordings like this one can be difficult to interpret on many different levels simultaneously. Simply transcribing the words can be challenging, requiring, requiring not just the obvious skill of fluency in a given language, but a knowledge of obsolete terms and an ear accustomed to the chronic distortions of the acoustic recording process. But there's also the way in which the words are spoken, the paralinguistic features of the performance. Cultural expectations in this area appear to have changed radically since the early 20th century. The, the changes seem at least somewhat consistent across languages, uh, perhaps under the common influence of the introduction of the microphone. But we shouldn't ignore the possibility of contemporaneous cross-cultural variation in older modes of delivery. Uh, for example, the style of delivery on this disc in Polish recorded in the United States during the First World War with titles that translate to strike and out of work is, at least to my ear, obviously a product of its time. But to what degree could it also be shown to be a product of its place and its community and of a specific performance tradition peculiar to them? <laughs> One subtype of early phonographic audio theater that has received particular attention from scholars examining different linguistic traditions is the descriptive specialty depicting scenes of the First World War. Some recordings of this kind were produced in English. Uh, both in the United States and in Great Britain, and some of the British examples have been productively written about by Tim Crook, Richard J. Hand, and others. Uh, Crook, in particular, makes an effort to situate them within a longer history of phonographic audio theater, suggesting that the British descriptive specialties of the First World War drew on a tradition that can be traced back to one well-known descriptive specialty of the Boer War of 1899 to 1902, the departure of a troop ship orchestrated by the important pioneer recording artist Russell Hunting. Like the descriptive specialties of the First World War, the departure of a troop ship would have been calculated to stir up sentiments of patriotism. The podcast, The Sound of the Hound, refers to it as the first propaganda record. But if we consider it as a piece of audio theater, and specifically as one depicting a departing ship, I would argue that it can be traced back even further to some of the humorous cylinders which Russell Hunting had produced in the United States during the 1890s, such as Casey's Departure by Steamboat. But similar descriptive specialties can be found in other languages as well, and ones that may be drawing on other traditions. The Columbia E-Series contains a number of descriptive specialties depicting scenes of the First World War in Italian, recorded in Milan starting around August 1914. Here's the conclusion of one of them with a title that translates to the departure of our troops for the Austrian frontier, a departure in this case by train rather than by ship. <laughs> Descriptive specialties seem to have been recorded rather earlier in the war than the British ones, and there may have been a good reason for that. If we look back through earlier listings in the Columbia E-Series, we find a sizable group of similar titles dealing with events of the earlier Turco-Italian War of 1911 to 1912. If the Italian recording industry was quick to get out a group of descriptive specialties dealing with events of the First World War, that might be because there was already an established tradition of producing such records in Italy. 
as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong about this, the Italian descriptive specialties of the First World War were each conceived of as separate self-standing pieces. However, some descriptive specialties in English extended a continuous narrative arc across multiple sides and multiple discs, not 40 like in Myanmar, but still it's you know, significant. Uh, for example, one British series issued in 1917 was made up of the six sides listed here, beginning with departure for the trenches in the front, uh, ending with a return home. And this phenomenon was apparently not limited to English. In uh, August of 1916, a performer named Jula Saloy recorded two pairs of war-themed descriptive specialties in the United States for Victor, one in Hungarian and one in German. These would be interesting to compare with each other. But at about the same time, Saloy also recorded a four-side set, all in Hungarian, for the Columbia E-Series. In an article of 2015 in Mojo just uh, dealing broadly with the impact of the First World War on Hungarian recordings, uh, Sabo Ferenciano draws attention to this series, characterizing it as a four-part audio oh, yeah. play. No. As calm as it, as it may have been in Myanmar, the extension of works of audio theater across multiple discs with a continuing storyline rather than unrelated episodes had been very uncommon in the Anglophone phonography of the United States. In fact, I know of only one definite example, Old Plantation Scenes, a series of uh, three single-faced discs recorded by Victor, uh, issued by Victor in 1903. And as far as I'm aware, the multi-part British and American series of First World War scenes were all recorded later than Soloy's series in Hungarian. But if we look back earlier in the E series, we find that some other four-part narrative series had been recorded in Europe and released in the United States just prior to the outbreak of war, probably during 1913, judging from the matrix and catalog numbers. Here's one in Hungarian, Mives uh, Karier. Uh, movies career or art, art career. Uh, the titles and catalog description show that the four sides represent scenes of a person's life set many years apart. Thus, side one is childhood, side two is in the military, and so forth. <laughs> Here's another four-part series in German, uh, Von der Wiege bis zum Grabe, or From the Cradle to the Grave. Uh, this time, Spotswood's discography doesn't identify the subject matter of the different sides, uh, but by listening, we find that the overall approach seems somewhat similar to Mueve's Carrière. Uh, for example, part two likewise depicts the character's experiences in the military. <laughs> Given the timing, it appears possible, possible, that this distinctive kind of four-side series originated in Europe, that it entered the United States in 1913 by way of imported matrices, and that these served in turn as a model or inspiration for Soloy's four-side series of 1916, which might have done the same in turn for the multi-side series in English recorded in 1917. This is just a hypothesis so far. A lot more fact-finding and survey work would be needed to turn it into anything more like that. Maybe someone in here knows an example that would demolish it in a second. We'll find out. But it's obviously a very different kind of hypothesis than I could have come up with if I'd looked at recordings in only one of these languages. I offer it here as a very tentative example of the kind of insight a cross-cultural comparative approach to the history of phonographic audio theater might bring. There's also one other type of recorded speech I'd like to talk about. In the United States, during the 1890s and 19 aughts, even cylinders and discs of the straightforward instrumental music usually began with speech, or more specifically, with spoken announcements that identified and framed their content roughly analogous to the title sequences of films and television programs. These spoken announcements are, I would argue, the single most consistently present structural element in the American commercial sound recordings of that time. Moreover, I find that the ways in which these announcements evolved over time 
can be quite interesting and revealing. For example, if we survey the spoken announcements found on early commercial recordings, we find announcers alternating between two different approaches. The following record was made for the Columbia Phonograph Company, Washington, D.C. by W.O. Beckenbaugh, auctioneer, Baltimore City, Maryland. Here the speaker announces that the record was made, past tense, even though it was in the process of being made when he originally spoke these words into the recorder. that the band will play future tense, even though listeners would be listening to it through the phonograph long after it had in fact, the band had in fact played it. Uh, record makers appear at this point to have been unable to decide whether a phonographically mediated performance should be presented as documentation of a past event or as a repeatable event that would take place each time it was played or, or something else. But by the year 1900, however, the spoken record announcement had evolved into a form that arguably allowed either interpretation, a kind of compromise between the two. On its gun, the little tiny gun from all the doors, a gun by Mr. John Carroll, gun of Paul Record. The American spoken record announcements of this period followed a rigid pattern in which the four elements I've identified here, genre, title, performer, and brand name, always appeared in precisely this order. Moreover, if elements were left out, as they increasingly were over time, it tended to be the same ones, implying a kind of hierarchy of importance. Most often omitted was the genre. After that, the company name, which may have helped to discourage record piracy and to promote brand recognition, but contemporaneous comments suggest that customers resented being subjected to an advertisement every time they listened to a record. After that, it was the performer and leaving only the selection title, although this was rather rare, it happened. And then between about 1903 and 1908, depending on the company, spoken announcements were abandoned altogether. Uh, one of their purposes had been to identify selections in the early wax cylinder era, when it was difficult to keep visible labels associated with records. But by 1908, that was no longer a concern. Yet another of their purposes, I believe, was to ease people into a phonographic listening experience at a time when this was still novel and potentially disorienting. But by 1908, listeners may have considered themselves far too sophisticated to need anything like that. And complaints had begun to come in about announcements taking up space on records that could better be used for more music. Throughout all these developments, however, it was almost unheard of for a commercial recording in the United States to begin with only the brand name of a recording company. I'm not aware of a single case on disc. In that light, I find it very interesting that some of the earliest recordings made by Columbia in Europe begin in precisely this way. So for example, if we listen to the lowest numbered matrices in the 40,000s block assigned to Germany, we find that some of them begin original Columbia Aufnahme or original Columbia recording. Original Columbia Aufnahme. Others invert the order to say Columbia Original Aufnahme. Columbia Original Aufnahme. Yet other discs in the same block with higher slightly matrix numbers suggesting a slightly later date instead begin with the words Columbia Record. Some of the first Columbia recordings from about the same time in the 35,000s block assigned to the Russian Empire, including Warsaw, likewise began with the words Columbia Record. Columbia appears to have abandoned the practice of including these brand name only announcements rather quickly in both Germany and Russia, but it has parallels elsewhere that seem to have been more enduring. Here, for example, is a pressing of a Turkish matrix recorded about 1907 announced Odeon Record. Odeon Record. And here's a pressing of a Syrian matrix recorded about 1913 announced Gramophone Company. Gramophone Company. 
So the, the practice of announcing records with only a brand name in this way appears to have continued in parts of the Middle East, including Syria and Lebanon, as something that was done not always, but frequently, through the 1940s or 1950s. Uh, sometimes the brand name is also followed by a description of the selection, but even then the brand name always appears to come first and not last, as had invariably been the case in the United States, suggesting a different ranking of priorities. It's evident then that spoken announcements on 78 RPM records followed significantly different evolutionary paths in different regional markets. Uh, meanwhile, there are various functions we could imagine the brand name only announcement as serving, uh, perhaps as an anti-piracy measure, an advertisement, or a marker of authentication. Thinking in terms of such functions, we might be able to come up with hypotheses as to why brand name only announcements were used when and where they were. Were these markets in which record piracy was more of a threat? Uh, were these records played mostly in settings where announcements seemed less intrusive? I don't know. I'd welcome any other thoughts or examples you might have that I mentioned this was all very exploratory. Uh, we're, since we're all very related here in our topics, we're hoping to save uh, questions to the end because we suspect some of them may overlap a bit. So with this, I'd like to turn the uh, uh, floor, floor, podium, whatever it is, over to our final speaker, my uh, fellow uh, alumnus of the Folklore and Ethnomusicology Program at Indo, uh, Indiana University, Dr. Xiaoxi Wei, who is now a... Uh, Fellow at SOAS in London, what's the name of the specific? Newton. Newton Fellow at uh, SOAS at the University of London, Director of China uh, Database for Traditional Music. And uh, he'll be presenting on a group of uh, very interesting spoken word for us. Um, um, thanks to uh, the conference um, has been an inspiring place for um, thinking about linguistic and sonic boundaries uh, within uh, modern nations. And many panels address the topic of using language in a in a recording act, whether it is about language in music or music as language. And my name is Xiao Xi Wei. Um, I'm an early career scholar at School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, a case in the Sinophone, the Chinese speaking region. Um, from a social cultural perspective, the concept of China as a nation has been defined and contested to its languages. China could become a modern nation, partially because different parts of China have the shared tradition of using Chinese written scripts of events. And, and however, since the late 19th century, there have been debates about whether the vastly different regional dialects should be considered as wholly different languages. We can revisit some uh, such debates by examining a special sound collection from 1899. I'm going to introduce the Mullendorf, uh, um, Mr. Mullendorf, his collection of Chinese poetry chanting and our research project. I aim to situate the scholarly consideration for studying the collections across various fields, primarily the recording history and the historical biography of China in the early 20th uh, century. Paul, Paul Grug von Mühlendorf was a German Crucian diplomat who spent most of his career in China and Korea. Korea. Mildorf is mostly known 
for his service as an advisor to the Korean king in the 19th century and his contribution to uh, the Sinology, the study of China. While serving as a commissioner of costume uh, in Ningbo, a mid southeastern city close to Shanghai, Millendorf asked the speakers of 16 Chinese dialects um, to recite the same poem, returning home uh, by an ancient poet, Tao Yuanming, onto wax cylinders. He later published the phonetic transcriptions of the recitations in the book entitled Classification de uh, Dialecte Chinois, uh, published in 1899, and sent copies of the cylinders to the 1900 uh, Universal Exposition in Paris. Mullendorf, um, the, the Mullendorf project was largely forgotten until a group of the cylinder recordings in the collection of Mr. Charlie Hummel was recently identified as belonging to it. The Mullendorf collection is the first known ethnographic field recording made in China, as far as Patrick and I are aware. Some years ago, Mr. Charlie Hummel bought a box of cylinder from a Swiss collector. Patrick and I also believe the names of Chinese city written on the box of the cylinders indicates a type of dialects, which has been proven to be accurate. In this example, there are Suzhou, Jinghua, and Amoy. Here's a short excerpt of the Mullendorf uh, recording in the Jinghua, Jinghua dialect. Among all the cylinders in Charlie's place, this is a relatively this more listenable and uh, comprehensible piece. <laughs> Our friend Charlie Hamill passed away just a few days ago. Thus, we are contributing this presentation to his preservation of the cylinders. Uh, and indeed, in his very last email sent to us, he wrote, Dave, uh, meaning Mr. David Givanoni, who just had done the final lines at the digitization of the cylinders, he said, Dave, can't thank you enough for all your hard work. And the cylinders have more miles traveled than me and still got good sounds. All of this is very important, not only to me, to us, but the world. Uh, my colleague Patrick Fixter have done extensive research on the history of these cylinders, including and beyond the cylinder ones at Charlie's place. In 1900, Leon Azoulay of the Society of Anthropology in France had spearheaded the society's efforts to start building a phonographic uh, museum, uh, taking advantage of the years Universal expose, Exposition in Paris to make recordings of uh, visitors attending from various parts of the world. Remarking in 1900, Azule announced, uh, here's a direct quote, Sir Robert Hart, the director of Chinese costume had put together by uh, Mühlendorf the phonographic series of the 16 principal dialect of China. He sent these phonograms as well as a large number of phonograms of Chinese music to the exposition. This example will certainly be followed everywhere. Governments or individuals will put together a collection of dialects and popular songs and music from their res respective countries and will send us the original copies of them. The work of Mühlendorf, Mr. Mühlendorf contains the opinion of the author on the history and classification of these dialects, as well as the transcriptions in Latin characters of Chinese piece spoken before the phonograph by the representative of the 16 Chinese dialects. Um, the phonograms were recognized immediately uh, by competent indi individuals. 
be that as it may, the ideas of phonographic collection of dialects has begun, as you see in China. It is to be hoped that the so-called civilized nation will attempt to make similar collections for their language and patois, meaning the vernacular language, uh, especially as a patois. The language of small nations are vanishing with frightening rapid rapidity before the official language or the language of larger nations. Uh, I will propose to the Society of Anthropology that it distribute to the great libraries of France, and if desired, of foreign countries, the copies, too numerous of us, of the work of Mr. Mühlendorf. This is a direct quotation of Leon Azoulay. Nowadays, the cylinders of Azoulay's phonogram museum is now managed by the Center of for Research in Ethnomusicology, CREM, in France. Due to some unclear reasons, out of Mühlendorf's original set of 16 dialects, only 11 are now available for online listening on the CREM website. To put an important note, Mühlendorf recorded multiple versions of performance of the 16 dialects, totaling around a few dozen cylinders. Patrick's working hypothesis has been that Willendorf intended to send additional sets of cylinders to London, Berlin, and St. Petersburg and elsewhere to complement the set he had sent to Paris. But that his unexpected death in 1901 derailed these plans such that cylinders instead end up being disposed uh, of in some other ways, for example, passing on to the position of his daughter, Dora. Patrick's hypothesis may explain why the movement of cylinders can be found in multiple places now, and why you may see uh, the label of European cities on the boxes as uh, in the examples. Uh, let's talk about the content, chanting content of the, um, the cylinders. Uh, the sole poem chanted by different uh, performers is called Returning Home, Gui Chu Lai Xi Ci, a small lyrical piece written by this uh, poet Tao Yuanming. Um, Tao Yuanming was one of the best known poets uh, during the 6th uh, dynasty period in the 4th century. He was later regarded the foremost representative of what we know as fields and garden poetry, Tian Yuan Shi, in which he found inspiration in the beauty and serenity of the natural world close at hand. Tao Yuanming spent much of his time in reclusion, living in the countryside, farming and reading and drinking wines, and writing poetry um, in which he often reflect on the uh, pleasure and difficulties of life. So Tao Yuanming's particular symbolism and the general returning to home theme inherited musical tradition from the music bureau of Han Dynasty long time ago um, and has been significantly influencing uh, Chinese literature and oral, oral traditions. So. Um, so I will read the first book, two lines, and so you will, you will see how you pronounce it in the modern uh, Mandarin pronunciation. Uh, we'll listen to one of the cylinders copy uh, recorded in Hubei. Oh, boy, 
of lyrical food, a combination of verses and prose could reflect the uniqueness of chanting as a distinctive local tradition. And third, local chanting often reflects some key characteristics of local narrative singing and traditional operas, even often mixing some of both into the performance. As you may hear in, in both the pieces, they sound like singing. Um, since 2022, Patrick and I have been uh, organizing the research uh, team to compile, digitize, and promote the Mühlendorf uh, collection. Patrick has done extensive research on the history of the collection. Mr. David Givanoni preserved and, and uh, digitized the cylinders at uh, from the Charlie Hamel collection. Pictures shown here are the equipment and shape of the cylinders. Some of them are very much worn. Uh, I'm now working with scholars from universities in China um, to study the content of the uh, recordings. Uh, at this early stage, in order to contextualize a project, I, I plan to discuss the collection in relation to the recording history and politics of Chinese dialects and historiography of China a little bit. I believe such uh, contextualization will identify the collection's value and because it could play a symbolic and indexing role in representing the powers in the uh, Sinophone. Uh, in March 1903, British company uh, Gramophone started its business in China entrusting a local company called Mutri uh, and the company to release the disc in Shanghai. This is the earliest known locally recorded uh, commercial 78s in China. Columbia started recording in Shanghai in 1904. Some sources say that the year was 1903. The content including uh, Beijing opera and many other operas in various places of China and also folk songs and instrumentals. And it was also known as Wulman Records because Wulman is a local company and people use that in the local slang. Victory and known as Wu uh, Kedu Records or the Yi Cuo Records in its early days. Odian and Beck was almost among, also among the, uh, the early labels in China. So especially Odeon become the famous scouting records and documented some many key Beijing operas uh, in the first decades of uh, 20th century. EMI down is an extremely important label in China's recording history. Uh, start the market in 1907. So, uh, you, you can hear that it's hand engraved in core on the core, and there's a, uh, sometimes there's a red rooster logo. So, looking at the early history of China's recording history, Beijing Opera was among the most promoted and main content recorded on 78s at that time. So, um, so in the research conducted by China Database for Traditional Music. 78 has profoundly shaped the performance of Beijing opera and many other types of music too. Examining the documentation from 1905 to uh, 1932, artists, audience, and stakeholders' attitudes has changed a great deal. We found that people gradually started to treat the 78s as a main medium for Beijing opera, gradually replacing stage shows. And the vocal role of dan, meaning a, 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 a genre 
uh, in which a male performing female became the favorite and the most uh, uh, promoted genre, replacing others. Into the PRC era in the late 1940s, the dance performers of Beijing Opera became established as national treasure. Why I'm mentioning this? Because I'm drawing a relevance between the recording history of Beijing Opera and the Mühlendorf recordings. Both Chinese dialects and uh, traditional operas were favored according to their tonality. Similar to the process of certain subgenre of Beijing opera being selected and promoted, dialects has been also has also been recorded, listened to, and promoted according to their tonality. Um, Mühlendorf's reporting can be examined under such selective context. At the beginning, at the end of the imperial uh, imperial period. Qing Empire in China, there was a general trend for promoting the vernacular language. Uh, audience have found a widespread desire to listen to the speech of ordinary people, particularly those outside the Mandarin hierarchical system. So Mullendorf recording documented the following two types of the vernacular speech. The first is literary uh, content in local dialect. For example, the cylinders recorded in Suzhou and Amoy dialects. Literary content in local Mandarin, for example, the, uh, the, the Wenzhou and the Hubei uh, content. The recordings can also be seen as a relevant to early act of making dictionaries of dialects by for, foreign missionaries and scholars in the 19th century. So those are among the most famous ones. Um, shown in the, on the picture. And Mullendorf's efforts can also be seen as relevant to later recordings in the UK by Lao Shi at SOAS, University of London. The set of records was recorded in 1926. Um, so Lao Shi and two British academies jointly uh, compiled um, a, a Chinese phonography uh, a phonograph record textbook called the Speech Field. The records were done by Lao Shi himself, containing 16 discs and 30 lessons uh, in very standardized Mandarin pronunciation, representing a Beijing-centric dialect. This recording are considered an example of the unifying power of the language after the collapse of the Qing Empire in 1911 when the new nationalist party sought a national oral language. Mandarin became the official national language dialect in 1911, one vote beating Cantonese. Um, in the last, I'm hoping uh, to say that Mühlendorf's collection touches on several issues within the historiography of China in the early 20th century uh, China. Uh, further studies of Mühlendorf and the collection may shed greater light on the perspective of other foreign scholars, missionaries, and expeditioners who played significant roles in, the, in this period of China's history. Current Chinese academia is dominated by what's so-called pluralistic unity and anti-colonial and anti-imperial discourses. The Chinese authority has termed some scholarship, which deviates from this discursive framework as uh, historical nihilism to discredit any out of party perspective. To various research on Bertolt Laufer, Robert Hart, Joseph Rock, Sven Hadding, we have seen some clearly useful perspective and materials that may promote a more comprehensive understanding of modern Chinese history than the bar set by the current Chinese uh, authority. Um, so in this presentation, I introduced Mühlendorf and the collection reflecting on the aesthetic, cultural, and sonic values um, 
I situated the collection in this in three main areas. Um, the collection um, in relation to the uh, 78s made by the Western labels in the early 20th century China. So reflecting a proliferating tendency in recording and appraising tonality-based aesthetics and social value. Uh, this time was in the end of the period of the empire. Second, such a tendency also may be relevant to the rising national political power in selecting an authoritative dialect to represent China as a coherent nation state. Third, the study of Mühlendorf and his contemporaries can be useful to balance the current monolithic scholarly discourse in studying the modern history of China. Thanks you for your listening. <laughs>